Our next speaker has written the book, Decision Making for Dummies. And that helped her articulate some of the more complex dynamics that power humans and companies. And now she will share with us handling uncertainty in the decision-making process, bringing your body's technology online. So ladies and gentlemen, bring some energy into the room. Stand up and give a warm applause to Donna Jones. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. It's nice getting here and finding out people are listening to the podcast. They're reading the articles on the Huffington Post. And now I have a new podcast running as well. So that's, that's it's just nice to know that, that all that that I'm doing in my little cave is actually coming out of the other end and being of value to somebody. So that's pretty cool. Um, we are. Whoops. That's not what I wanted to do. Is this where the wizards come? And let me just try this. Oh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. We are at what is called a bifurcation of human consciousness. And what that means is that we're at a split where the old systems, the old systems thinking, the old systems theories are no longer capable of handling the complexity that we're in now. And we're seeing that show up in the struggles that large companies are having, the ones that are traditionally managed where they were set up on hierarchical principles of command and control doesn't mean hierarchy is wrong or bad. It just means that those principles aren't really working so well anymore. So we're seeing this, this, this shift. And in fact, I did, just did an interview with Irvin Laszlo, uh, global systems thinker. It's on the new podcast called Insight to Action. It's called What is Reality? Because when you think about it, you go into every environment and you see reality through the lens that you bring. And so that question helps us reshape and reframe how we think about consciousness and how we think specifically about the interactions that you set up in the company. So that is the split. It's asking us to go much deeper. Oops. I think my buttons are... So what we have... Sorry, I've not flown one of these things before, so I'm having a great time with it. Um, what we have in traditional companies is uh, it's like a horse race. These horses know they start at the beginning and they end up where they back. They're going around in circles. Most companies don't know that. And, and the insight that I noticed that came out in the beginning that you might find valuable is that most companies are still basing their decisions on beliefs. They're basing their decisions on the belief that what worked in the past or that past things will apply to the future. That's, abs that's absolutely not true. As was pointed out um, in the last talk, nothing's predictable. Absolutely nothing. We don't have control over anything except our response and ourselves. And so collectively, we can choose to lead differently. And that's very powerful. Absolutely very powerful. So. So there, there is a, the certainty part of it is that you have trust and confidence in yourself. That's the absolute part of the certainty. The other part of the certainty is if you, if the company that you're in or that you're managing or that you're running, or if you continue to run it based on the traditional practices, you will be doomed. There's no question about it. It's, we're at the very strong part of adapt or die. Joseph Chilton Pierce said, we actually, he's a social developmental biologist. He actually said we have contained within us a deep, a deep capacity, deep creative talent that only adversity can bring forward. This is the place where instead of going to the remote television, playing golf, or getting lost in some of the many escape arts we can do, we dig deeper. And we dig deeper into ourselves and find a spirit that collectively we can plug in and change the world. And, and by that, I mean change the world. Pick big, massive, transformational uh, goals and purposes. That is the, that is the number one uh, point to come out of uh, to my, this, this comp the part of the conversation. So most companies right now are saying, let's get to the quarter. That app does absolutely nothing for human creativity. If you can just feel it, you know, let's race to the next quarter. Let's be like those horses. It's like, yeah, it's not going to do it. So it, we're talking massive here. We're talking, uh, you know, ch child poverty. Pick a big issue that you know you can't do alone. Pick a big issue that you know the company can't do alone. That's the kind of issue. That's the kind of purpose that will galvanize that creative talent. So you're going, you're thinking big, 10x big, global, uh, Google type big. The implication is that the kinds of thinking that have been 
mm, habitual in the past, and in most companies that's analytical thinking, very linear. Input, process, output, that's linear, very linear. It, those kind, that kind of thinking, again, is that it, it just doesn't work. Because it doesn't, it, it, I mean, picture a complex system, there's all these things going on, and the idea is we're gonna run like that? No, it's not gonna happen. So, so it's asking us, collectively and individually, to back away from the idea that past, present, future, past, past, present equals future, and to step away and just say we create it in the moment. It is, it is a complex dynamic of beautiful interactions, and you just never know what's going to show up, and that's the beauty of it. So it asks for far greater trust in the deeper nature of who you are, uh, which is pretty darn exciting. So it moves from very linear to expanded awareness. Now, it doesn't mean you abandon analytical thinking. It means you just know when to use it. There are times when you can bring it out, and there are other times when it just it, you can't see the picture at all. So what I'm doing in this part now is giving you the big picture, and then we're going to move down into specific skills. And then in the question time, I want you to just go anywhere you want, ask me anything, I don't care, <laughs> wide open, so. All right, so the expanded awareness then um, helps, takes us back to the brain. We've heard a bit about the brain already in a in couple of rooms. Um, you know that when you're in an organization, the brain is highly valued, it's very mental. So change is driven through thinking it through as opposed to feeling it through. Emotions are sort of those things that we, we're not, we need to, you know, we, reg, we regulate them and the idea, the code under the word regulate is we control them. But in actual fact, the emotions are your strongest ally right now. So, and they're the strongest ally in change, but it means looking at it quite differently. So one of the things that decision makers are doing is they're, they're as I mentioned earlier, they're basing their, their decisions on beliefs of the past. So the, one of the top biggest core belief we have right now is that, you are in business to make a profit. That is your purpose. And if you think that, that company will no longer exist because it's not good enough. It's not big enough. And what happens in the decision making is it narrows the frame and, those comp and, and what that means is you don't see anything that creates the profit because too busy, they're too, much, too busy running after revenue and, and, and not brain science wise thinking about how to do things like create savings. So I just finished doing an interview with J. Joseph Bragdon. Um, the, the, the Huffington Post article will go up tomorrow. No, Thursday. We'll go up Thursday and the podcast will go up in a couple weeks from now. He has had a portfolio since 1996 of 60 companies. These are companies that manage themselves as living systems. They understand they're part of nature and they understand that it, in order to sustain themselves, they need to adapt and adjust constantly. These companies have a mean and uh, an average age of 100 years. They are long-term long companies and they've been around for a long time. So they see the world very differently and the financial results that come out of companies that think like that and see like that are significant. Significantly higher, by the way. <laughs> so that changes, it shows you how the decision making alters the results. The bottom line is here, as I've said before, you're the app that you're waiting for. So we're going now into the inner technology that you bring inside yourself because we have decision-making apps. There's a, a bunch of them out there that you can pull up and drain. Every time I see that, I think, yeah, that's cool. You might be able to use that to offset a few biases, hopefully, maybe. Uh, because awareness is one thing that, that does not counterbalance bias. You actually have to design for that. But you, by, at least by being aware that you're biased, then you can take those steps, which, which does help. So let's take a look at the inside of what goes on. This is your energy field. It emanates from the heart. Uh, the major work that's been done on this out of the HeartMath Institute in Boulder Creek, California. They've been doing this work for about 30 years, different kinds of research projects, and uh, with, all, with entrepreneurs as well. So your heart, your um, energy field looks like this. The heart uh, zone, <laughs> find the right term for that. The heart zone is about 5,000 times more strong, uh, stronger than the brain. The brain is electrical, but the heart is where the electrical and the magnetic come together. So that's your field. Now, that means that where you're sitting, if you kind of sense how you're feeling, know that your, your heartbeat can be measured in the person next to you, brain waves. So there, your fields will overlap. How many of you have ever gone home at the end of the day and just felt drained? absolutely drained. 
or Overso gone home and felt jazzed. And so, so these overlapping fields then have a big influence on how you feel. They have a big influence on how you make your decisions because your emotions are always affected by it. That limbic system that was pointed out in the keynote works, you know, works, uh, well, I'll explain how fast it works, but it works phenomenally faster than the brain could. So when you're in groups then, Let's, that's in this picture here. Think of your organization. You've got a group of fields going on, and they've actually done some interesting work in this because when I was facilitating a lot of organizational change, I would notice that I would go into organizations and I'd be seeing patterns. Really easy to see the patterns. And, and you would I would find that, that because these patterns existed, it would tell me that there were patterns of communicating, patterns of relationships. And in, in situations where those patterns were destructive or negative or backstabbing or that kind of stuff, then the, 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 org the, the building itself adapted a, a, a footprint of that. So you could take all the people out and put new people in and you still had that problem. Now, they're becoming very aware of that in the United States where they're revi revising the education system. They found it's easier to just take the building down and start a fret. Like, even not in the same location, just build somewhere else. And you also know if you go into certain spaces, certain ambiances, when you walk into a store, you can feel retail is a really good place to experiment with that. And I actually toyed with doing that tomorrow in the workshop, but I don't think, I, I might, we'll see. But it, you, you can go in and you can feel the difference. So that's why that's, that's important to you. It's, this is the field of the planet, uh, the geomagnetic field of the planet. And, and what's interesting about this is in September 11th in 2001, just in advance of 9-11, uh, there was a disruption in the sensors that are stationed where just before, I couldn't use the picture because it's copyrighted, but, um, so you'll have to watch my finger. But just before the event, if this was the event of 9-11, the, the Earth sensors started doing this. And then when the buildings got hit, it went way up. And then for days afterwards, it, it uh, blipped out. What that instigated, sorry, was the idea that the, the Earth was registering a precognizant knowing that that event was about to take place. So that has started a whole scientific exploration into the global coherence, meaning if we can attune our hearts to feel better about ourselves and to feel better about the world and to contribute from a happier uh, state and place and be at peace, then it will have a positive effect on the planet's capacity for equilibrium, which is kind of useful for us since we're on it. It also tells you a bit about intuition because intuition is precognizant. That means if you're thinking about it, it's too late. <laughs> it's way too late. It's already happened. So your decision making in that regard is done. And that is why most people don't know that 95% of their decisions are made intuitively and only 5% of them are made consciously, roughly speaking. That's a big, that's a big difference. So now let's look a little more closely at how that works. If I can get these buttons. Yay. Oh, got carried away. <laughs> All right, so this is the second part, your intuition. You have three sets of intuitive strengths. Now, for a long time, there's only been, mostly they talk about one, and that is innate knowledge. That would be these guys. Um, the, the idea that you have picked up knowledge from all the decisions you've made, and so over time, the more experience you have, the, the stronger your intuition. And I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. That means if you're older, then you're more intuitively attuned, except I'm working with street youth. And I'm asking them, you know, have you ever had a time when you've had a red flag go up and you haven't paid attention to it? And they go, oh, yeah. And all right, so what happened? Oh, well, jail or <laughs> all these bad things happen. <laughs> and so, so, I mean, we all have intuition. The difference is that the longer you, and the more decisions you make, the stronger it gets. Because the more decisions you make, you build up a database that you're your intuition uses, and I'll explain a little bit about how, but there's actually a map of it in the in Decision Making for Dummies that I adapted from Gary Klein's work with the US military. It's very, his is very complicated, mine's obviously simpler, but it, it was just a way of sort of saying, this is how it works. It's a fast processing thing. So innate knowledge is one of them. That's all the great stuff you've learned over the years and tallied up and put into your database. This one I decided represented non-local intuition. Uh, that would be, um, how many of you have ever had a moment when 
when you know something's wrong with someone you care about. Okay, that's non-local intuition. And I'm, I know there's some good stories in there too. Uh, example was one of my friends sat down and she told me about her mom who was in the Ukraine. She was in Vancouver, Canada. And she kept having these dreams of her mom dying and, and horrible things. It, the dreams weren't very pleasant. So she call up her mom and say, how are you doing? She said, oh, I'm feeling fine. Everything's good. She actually wasn't feeling fine, but she didn't want to tell her daughter that. And finally, um, she wanted to go and visit her and didn't, and her mother passed. So these, are the, 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 these things are there. There was also something in the United States, a, a little note about a woman who was at work, and her husband was at home working on the car, and she just said, all of a sudden she just had this feeling that said something's not right, and she got in her heart, car and drove home and found out the car had fallen on him with the jack so saved his life basically so these are the these are that's non-local intuition that's that two things happening simultaneously but but connected through time and space and by the way urban Laszlo talks about this on that what is reality interview too so that's kind of cool and this third area is the one that w the reason why this research resonated so strongly for me and it's called energetic sensitivity and that's the focal point not only for a little bit more of what we'll talk about, uh, but for tomorrow's conversation in the, in the workshop will be very much around how do we use this sensitivity that we have, whether you're aware of it or not, and use it for better communications, use it to sense your culture, is your culture on track or not, is your workplace healthy or not, and, and thirdly, uh, decision making. Because when you can use your, the, the thing that I didn't mention, it, when you've got this field, that field is picking up social and emotional data, as well as you've got facts going in. So it's taking all that data. Some people think that intuition is about emotion. No, it's one part of it. So it's this whole mashup, and that makes it a pretty interesting uh, zone to be in for the most part. So data, that field that I explained, that big field that you saw of yourself, uh, which is measurable, that's how they came up with those pictures, they, um, the field, Processes data at different speeds. So anybody here ever felt overwhelmed? Like completely overwhelmed? Never. <laughs> All right. So uh, here's why. Your conscious mind, the part that you're trying to take in all the stuff, you've got your to-do lists and you're taking in all this data and everything's going on, it runs at about 50 bits of information, which actually, if I could have found a picture of a Volkswagen going uphill, I think that would have been better. Um, I went around the world in a Volkswagen van and, and they don't like hills at all. So, And it wasn't even that, it was a bigger one, but they still don't like hills. So. And then the, the, the other one, the subconscious part, is running at about 50 million bits of information at the same period of time. Warp. So that's something that we're not aware of for the most part. That's just running all the time, which is uh, what you want to take advantage of. So that brings you to how do you put this into play? How do you use it? And one of the things I notice in organizations is they tend not as, you know, they tend, they tend to be looking at processes. They tend to be looking at behaviors. They want to fix behaviors through process never really looking more deeply than that. But the, the real leverage points are at the belief zone, they're at the value zone, and, and the behaviors are shaped by what's going on in the context. This is biology. It's basic biology, actually. But when you put that into play inside organizations, you come in and your contextual awareness changes what happens. So you know that you will behave, as, as was pointed out earlier, you behave one way in one situation and you go into another and you might observe yourself saying something the opposite of what you just said over there because the context has changed. So there's, there's just, it, this is something to be aware of, it's just something to notice. I notice now because I've been traveling so much in different spaces, I can go into a space and the space will change my behavior. Will I get up and run in the morning? No, I'll do something else. It, it's really fascinating. So I put in this one with the solar flares because what a lot of people don't know is that we have some X-class flares and every now and again they get excited, they're solar flares. That's when humans go weird. So there's a correlation between solar flares and human weirdness at times. And, and so that sometimes when it gets really weird, I'll get people calling me up and going, what's going on? So first do is you check and see is there any solar flare activity? Because if there is, it makes it easier. And then after that, you can navigate. Uh, sorry? It is, exactly. I think so too. I mean, you're having a bad day? Yeah, we're having a solar flare day. <laughs> 
Yeah, really handy. But um, anyway, the other part of it is just being attention to what are you surrounded by. Um, I'm going to do a digression. This is my daughter, so <laughs> had to put her in there. But but anyway, uh, how are you feeling about what you're doing? What's your heart? Uh, What's your alignment between your mind, you know, what you're thinking and what you're feeling? Uh, if you've ever been in an environment where you've heard mixed messages, it's because the messenger had thinking one thing, I got to give this message out, feeling another, I don't believe in what I'm saying. That's how mixed messages get created. So contextual awareness, what's the situation? What's it calling forth in me? This is the reason why most executives, newly hired executives fail, especially ones that are coming in from emerging you know, through, from the, up from the company. They're coming into new leadership roles. They haven't been prepared for uncertainty. They haven't been prepared for ambiguity. They haven't been prepared for things to be unpredictable. And that's where they will fail. So learning those skills to go into a context that's new and different, make the adjustments, expand your skill set, that's really key. So contextual awareness, I think, is, is uh, one of the core values, or the core um, tools, if you will, for better decision making because as you move up into those executive decisions, it doesn't matter what size company you've got, you're going to be merging the, the, what you know, your facts, with what you don't know, which is everything else, and then making a, a decision from there. So the, the tool you have, and this goes back to what was being said at the beginning about emotional regulation, is about coherence. So coherence is, am I connected? Is my mind and my heart connected? Do we have a coherent connection? Harmonic connection would be the other term you'll see. Uh, the harmony, though, is not we're always friendly and happy and loving, and it, it, that's not harmony. Harmony will have, we can have the difficult conversations. We can do it in trust. We, we are like actually working with diversity because it makes things better. And it makes me better, it makes us better as a team. So that which means you've faced a lot of unconscious bias and you've, you've uh, worked with that directly rather than letting it run you. So coherence is the harmonic connection between the heart and the mind. And then the, th the next area that's very a big, huge ally for you in decision making in uncertainty is conscious perception. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean you're aware of what lens you're using. Are you using a linear frame of thinking? Are you using an analytical mindset? Most big companies are still using an analytical mindset. Engineers have a, have a fascinating time doing the <laughs> adjustment here with this. But, or am I looking at the entire system? Do I know when to back up and look at the entire system, all of life? What impact does my decision have? Will it have on my customers? Will it have on my employees? There are companies that, that are profiled in the article in the podcast in this, companies that mimic life. One of them reinvented itself by the executives serve the employees. The employees have frontline decision-making authority. They do all that decision-making. But the executives are there to serve them. So they flipped the whole thing and made them incredibly successful. Sensing then becomes, instead of thinking it through, you're sensing it through. That is your your um, asset for decision making in complexity and uncertainty. It's actually, complexity is a lot easier to work with in a whole lot of ways. It's very simple, it runs on very simple principles. There are principles of nature and, and it works quite, quite uh, uh, simply. And if we put it in energy terms, if you wanna know how your culture is going on in your organization, energy flows where attention goes. Just walk in and observe. Where's the attention going? Where's, where's the uh, energy flowing? That'll tell you exactly what you're creating in the moment inside that company, and inside that workplace. So it's a, it's a really easy principle to use to know, have we got a healthy workplace here? Am I supporting a healthy workplace? Are we looking at things uh, you know, in a way in which we can provide that support, the sense of belonging, the shared goals, and all those things? So it's the quality of interactions that's, that set the frequency of the space. And that's what creates that trust, sense of belonging, and shared goals. So there's some really interesting work that uh, uh, is coming out. Judith Glazer's done some work on conversational intelligence. Um, by the way, this changes how you change companies. Because instead of changing companies using the mind, you change companies using the quantum social networks. So you, you, you change through emotion. And, and that's a whole other talk, but that gives you some idea. So you're seeing and you're seeing the social and emotional networks because those are networks of performance. 
Uh, that research work was done by Hewlett Packard in 2005. A colleague of mine uh, was with the, she was the, the, I forget the title, but anyway, she headed up the inkjet division. And so they had a, a thing where they just said, wow, we've got phenomenal performance every single day. How, how come we're doing that? How, why is that happening? So she brought in a social biologist and he followed, he followed what he called follow the joy. He just followed the joy throughout the performance. And, and they discovered that, yes, they were organized like this as a hierarchy, but the performance ran like that. And most of it happened outside the boundaries of the company. So the network went well beyond the boundaries of the company. That was follow the joy. And they were just following the social uh, emotional networks in that case. And he said that every single organization they've ever been in, including the military, ran like that. So workplace culture is the st strategic and decision-making ad adaptive advantage. So the companies, the seven companies that are in this uh, article that's going up on the HuffPo on Thursday, and then the podcast I'll do, we'll profile them. The book is called Companies That Mimic Life. But that's the only research-based market-based research portfolio I'm aware of in the world. And if anybody has more, and I've already been talking to a few people about cool companies to interview because we've had a lot of fun. Mikel and Chris were on in January, and we've got a, I've got a whole list of self-managed companies. But we're looking really at helping, at providing models for other companies to go, yeah, this has been done already. There's, there's so much fear around stepping into that experimental zone but there's, it's been done. And if it isn't being done, it's being made up and iterated and co-created along the way. So leverage that system. Going forward here are your three simple things and then I'm going to open it up. One is review your beliefs. I was doing a leadership development course, delivering one, oh gosh, long, 15 years ago say, and somebody popped up out of there. You know what, self-managed teams don't work. Bam, that was a belief or mental model if you've read Peter Senge's work. So it was, it was, a, it was a belief there. And, and was it true? Well, maybe over here, maybe not there. So it was one of those things that got taken and brushed. Take a good look at where you're making those assumptions about what will work and what won't and why. And then replace it with just get rid of those beliefs because they're completely, they're not serving. Be very clear about what's serving you and what's not is what I'm saying. Value-based decision-making design the future. It's hard for people to do initially, but the companies that are designing the future base their decisions on values. Values are transient. They go above. They're not, we value money. No, no. We value trust. We value integrity. But they don't put it on the wall. You'll never see them posted on the wall. These, they live it. It's just easier to live than it is to write about it and throw it on the wall. They just live it. So that's, that's the thing, is to go back and say, well, what do we really value here? What values underpin this decision? There's always going to be one anchoring decision. Novo Nordisk's anchoring value is systemic health. If you get to a crunch in your decision-making process, you say, well, is this, is, should we do this or not? Does it contribute to sy systemic health or doesn't it? Very simple. So those are the things that when you get down to values, you start getting down to the organizing principles and you can anchor it in one or two that will help you serve as a guide when the wind's blowing and there's a hurricane and you're not sure what's going to happen next at all. Transparency is also one of the aspects of that. One of the interesting stories that came out of the uh, Japanese tsunami was there was a plant that didn't melt down and the plant that didn't melt down didn't do so, not because they weren't having the same problems, but because they made the uncertainties completely transparent. They kept saying, here's what we don't know, and they wrote it up. And as they wrote it up, they went, they managed that, they got that handled, and then the next one came up. So it was, a, it, it was a constant process, iterative process of saying, what don't we know? And that tames the, the amygdala because it sort of says, hey, we're in control of our response, we can do this. And that's what happened there. It's a really good story, it's in the HBR. Question the assumptions, that is something you can do all the time. What assumptions am I making about this person? What assumptions am I making about my, in our team? What assumptions are we making about risk? Because risk has got so much bias embedded in it. So uh, that's an easy one. And regulating your emotions, the entire heart math uh, step for doing that is indecision making for dummies, but the easiest way to regulate your emotions is just to, when you're stressed, head out to nature, go for a walk in the park nearby, don't stay in your head because that doesn't solve anything, but actually just be, be still for a bit and connect. And that will bring your brainwave state from beta down to alpha. 
which is more creative, and that'll allow you to be uh, calmer in the moment. So that's one method. If you don't have the time for doing that, the other way you can do it is to think about something, an enjoyable moment, time with your dog, your, your whatever, you know, what it, family, whatever makes you feel good and follow that. That's generally the rule when making decisions in uncertainty or complexity. Follow what feels good. <laughs> it's a very simple principle. So, yeah, in the workshop tomorrow, we'll be playing with the stuff that has an impact on communication, energetic sensitivity, decision-making, and uh, workplace well-being. That's the book. There you go. Questions? Hope that helps. Hope there's something in there for you. Questions, please. Thoughts? Observations? Yeah. Well, I guess there's two thoughts. Uh, one is, are these have, have you come to the place where you say, look, this is the one core value we have for the company, and we're going to use that to anchor the decisions that we're not sure about? Yeah, not one, but two, yeah. Okay, well, whatever. So that helps. That's, that's, the, that's the one side of it. The other side of it is that as long as you can tie it back to a value, what framework you're using for decision making? Because one of the things that I notice a lot of companies don't do is have any, have, they haven't given any thought at all to how they make decisions. They just run and go, run and go, run and go, and then clean up the messes afterwards. So, so it's, uh, it, that's a bit of a problem. And, and then, and in the course of that, there's a lot of people that don't get involved that should be involved, namely the people that it has an impact on. So laying out a decision making process that says, this is, this, like Cocoon Projects did a really good job of that. I put them in, in the book, but they've, we've also done webinars on that and stuff where, where they just sort of made a list of their, pro, of their decisions from complicated, you know, strategic, really important to the firm's success down to meh, and, and sort of then have the simplest tool to tackle each one and a time box for each one. So it's intentional. That's the other approach. But as long as you've always got it coming back to core values, if there's a real tension between those two, you know, t like a decision that, that's based on a value going that way and a value going that way, same decision, the conversation has to happen because the tension's coming from somewhere. That's sociocracy 3.0 right there, <laughs> right? Yeah, so the tension is, is a value, you might as well use it. May not be the values, it may not be the decision, but the tension will tell you something. That's in the emergent part, that's the beauty of that. It's like, oh, there's tension, sweet, let's work with that. Does that help? Yeah, good. Good. Anything else? What would you say? How? Yeah, you went on first. How to break up from this linear thinking? Yeah. You know what? I, I think I played with improv. I've played, and I mean, I'm. I used to be a really strong linear thinker, and still can be if I need to, but it wasn't serving. Um, my brain would, was hurting badly. In complex, in the more complicated, the more complex, not complicated, sorry, the more, <laughs> sorry, the more complex things got, the less I could use my brain to make sense of it. It, it, it was more a matter of feeling it all through first. So it, it just came out of knowing that, that the analytical stuff is really good for nailing down certain things, but you just, it's about widening that lens. So how do you do it? You get out and you experience different circumstances. You put yourself in places you, that you would, are completely unfamiliar, where you have no idea what to do next. The more out of control, or, or the, the, the more out of control you are, the better chance you've got of being able to see more. Sorry? <laughs> I didn't hear that. No, I think that's great, but for that, sometimes you can damage what things are not really doing. Okay. Or if you want to get to the feeling, or if you can kind of point to those cues to be able to say that perhaps we need to be rethinking how we are handling and approaching situations. And if it's linear thinking, that's the one that I did as a whole. And if that's wrong, then I need to have this one to bring those in. 
here's the thing. Linear thinking used to work really well because I used to train facilitators. So we used, to, we used to teach them to go, okay, when you're doing root cause analysis, you go back and, and you'd follow this linear path. And, and that was quite handy. There's a hole in the bucket. You know, you put the, the, you, know, the, you, you patch the hole, very easy. In complex systems, there's no way of knowing. You can't isolate the dot because it's all interrelated. So if you want to solve complex problems, you can't use linear thinking. It's, it's that simple. Yeah, that bad feeling about that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing to remember is that what we've learned from brain science is that our brain just loves familiarity because its job is to keep us safe. So the second something scary and novel comes up, it's going to wake up and pay attention. So naturally, the complacency that you're seeing in a lot of workplaces, teams, organizations comes from that comfort zone. It's just not going to serve. Not only that, there's no growth. Uh, personally or organizationally at all. It, you, you, you can't do it in this kind of environment. So it, it means disrupt yourself. I mean, that sounds cliche, I'm afraid, but, but it does mean that. So if you find something you've never... Go to a music concert, you have no idea what kind of music it is. Go. Find out. You know, um, Play a video game. Never played a video game, play a video game. Do something that you're, you walk in, you don't, know what, what to, you don't know the first thing to do. That will help because this is about mind expansion versus feeling safe. I mean, you know, don't jump off cliffs or anything like that, but <laughs> keep physically safe. <laughs> Any other questions? Thoughts, observations? Did any of this ring true through free, yeah? That's up to them. My job is just to present the information. I've spent a lot of time researching this. Oh, you mean if we look at the trajectory of human consciousness from that perspective? Uh, absolutely. I mean, here's the good news. The good news is we don't need everybody. We just need groups of people that are ready to roll. Oh, look at what goes on in the gaming industry. I wrote a treatment for virtual reality program on decision making that wasn't really going to be on decision making. And in the course, I stepped out for about six months because I got distracted and I didn't know how to get how, what to do with it. I come back in and oh man, <laughs> there's there's platforms out there. Vive, you know, Vive, the new Vive is out. There's just stuff is moving at such a speed. So I think I think that the people that are half, if you're in this room for heaven's sake, you're you're ready. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that the people that aren't ready don't show up. They, they know intuitively it's not right for them. It will be at some point, I hope, because it's a lot easier to be prepared than it is not to be. But, you know, that's just... Yeah. <laughs> you had some questions? Did you I just wonder, from your perspective, you said the game industry is on it. Moving but, fast. But, but, but if, you, if you look at other kind of organizations, how good are they at uncertainty and decision making? Well, if they operate like living systems, they're very good because they are decentralized and they operate like the human body, which really does function quite well when it's looked after. So it, 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 the, the organization as a human body is a conversation I had with cellular biologist Bruce Lipton back in 2005. And I, I did a, a, because it just seemed, it made sense. You know, it, these are replicating systems, they're self similar. You've got energy field in people. You've got energy field in the planet. You've got it, it, the you know the, the the there's lots of science out there if you if you want to get nerdy about it. So um, there's lots there. Did I answer your question? I don't think I did. Part of it. They, give it yeah. to me again. No, but but how, from from your perspective, how 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 good are organizations? If 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 it's going to vary from from those who are very early adopters in new technology and no, so forth. I mean overall we've got a lot of companies that I think are are doomed. Um, so so we're, we have these conversations all the time. I mean, I'm on a call with uh, Steve Denning every week along with a bunch of other people who are doing this work worldwide, and we, we ask ourselves that question all the time. Who, who can actually adapt? Who's ready to adapt? 
Are they going to wait until they fail? In which case, you know, and, and I get calls from millennials all the time because I end up coaching in those environments. So, which is, they mount to, what's going on? <laughs> and are they afraid or they just don't see what's going on? And it's both. Um, because a lot of the boomer executives are in the place where they're saying, eh, I don't want to learn anything new, and I just have three or four more years. If I can just wait it out, I'll get that pension. What they don't know is that the subtext reads, and which may or may not exist, but you know, they're, they're just aiming for the, I don't want to learn anymore. So overall, what we're asking people to do, what it asks people to do is move from doing the routine, habit, habitual stuff into learning mode. That's the difference. It's a difference in all these companies that are, see themselves as learning systems. They, there's no resistance to change. Why would there be? They know they can learn. They, it just shows up and they just go learn. It's, it's simple. So the resistance to change shows up in companies where they're still controlling structures, where they still think they're managing people instead of managing the work, and they, and they haven't got the, 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 the overall uh, mindset in place just to, to, to give people a goal and get out of the way. So I, what are we seeing? We're seeing startups figure it out some of the times. We're seeing medium-sized companies figure it out some of the times. We're seeing larger companies that have figured out few and far between that see themselves as living a system been around for a long time, like the ones I mentioned in that portfolio. And then we've got big companies that are, that are really struggling. And will they be able to adapt fast enough? The age is going down from, uh, I think it was 16 years last year. It's now down to 10 years longevity. This year, a study came, you know, it's, it's dropping fast. And when I talk to colleagues in the executive C-suite in New York and places like that, they just say, whoa, I just can't even believe what's going on. There's been this company that's closed, this one's closed. So the choice is theirs. I think the real question is, do you, do you feel like learning? What do you say? Interesting. And we will talk more about this after lunch because you will be back in the panel discussion. Yes. And you will be back tomorrow as well because we can choose your, your workshop tomorrow and uh, you have two other choices to make. Uh, Jonathan Reims will, will have a workshop uh, regarding agile leadership and uh, Mary Williams will have a workshop regarding be a brilliant people developers. So you need to do your choice today and in the info desk you can do your choice, the, the, the desk where you did your registration. So we'll take lunch and we'll meet here again at 12.40, 20 minutes to one. See you then. Yeah, thank you.